Let's open in prayer and then uh, go to God's Word together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made and given to us. And Father, I pray that in our chapel time this morning that you would take your Word, which is living and powerful and true, and use it to intersect our lives with the grace and the mercy and the love and the kindness and the hope that we need this morning, not just this morning, but throughout our lives. And Father, I pray that your spirit would be at work in our midst for your glory and your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, who lived through and survived imprisonment in a Nazi concentration camp, along with her sister, who unfortunately died just weeks before Corey's and the prison camp's release, she said this, she says, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow but it empties today of its strength. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it empties today of its strength. Now, I know that none of you have ever worried or been anxious, but you probably know somebody who has, right? And so maybe this message is for them, right? Of course I'm joking, right? Because we all, right, we all deal with worry and with anxiety. And this morning, that's going to be our primary focus, so we're going to look at some other things that Paul says, and, and then continuing tomorrow, uh, we're going to look at how Paul treats the subject of worry and anxiety. Worry has a profound effect on our lives. And, and we're all prone to worry, and, and we, we, we're all prone to getting into that what-if thinking, right? That what, and uh, second row here, can we help out? Sunglasses off and sit up, please. All right, that's all of you. We ask you to have respect for God's word and for this time. I know we're tired. And listen, if you're struggling and you're not off a little bit, I understand. But if you curl up and get comfy, that's disrespectful. All right, and we expect more. Worry is when we get into that what if thinking. Right, that how many of you would say, I've been in that what if scenarios, right? Where we create all those things in our mind and the worst case the scenarios. And we have imaginary conversations in our head. Have you ever had those? right? And so it's something we all deal with, and our, our goal is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we all face. And one of the things that we have to deal with if we're going to have a courageous faith is we have to deal with worry and anxiety, but what I want you to know and understand and see today and tomorrow is that God understands our tendency towards worry. He has compassion for our struggle with anxiety and fear. And he's not only called us to overcome those things, but I want you to see that he's given us the power and the ability and ways to deal with that. So I want you to see that courageous faith provides a path to experiencing the peace of God. The peace of God is something that we all need, and God wants us to have his peace. So chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 1, and Paul makes a, a bit of a transition in his letter here, and he says, So then... Right, based on everything that I've shared so far, right, as, as I've, if I've, and, and Paul's just gotten done in chapter three talking about his passion, right, to know God and, and to pursue him with all of his life and to pursue what God has saved him for and, and to strain forward and to forget what's behind. And then he says, So then, because of what God has done through the gospel, through his grace in my life, in this way, my dearly beloved brothers, my joy and my crown stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And so as Paul writes to his brothers and sisters, people whom he loved and cared about deeply, he says, I want you to stand firm. Right? I want you to have a courageous faith. I know you face danger. I know you face pain. I know you face fear. But I want you to have a courageous faith. Stand firm. But notice what he says. He says, stand firm in the Lord. Right? He doesn't say, you've got to be strong, you've got to toughen up, you've got to be able to handle everything. No, he says, stand firm, be courageous in your faith, but do it in the Lord. Paul often emphasized our spiritual position, that as believers in Christ, if we put our faith and trust in Him, we are in Christ. We belong to Him, and so we have to remember our position. And he says, stand firm, not in your strength, not in your ability, not in your power, but in the Lord, stand firm in Him, live for Him faithfully because He's with you. He wanted them to have a courageous faith. He didn't want them to give up, right? He wanted them to have a faith that persevered through the hard times. 
Then he goes on in verses 2 and 3, and he, he deals with a conflict that was actually going on in the, in the church. And, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here because of the limitations we have with time. But he says, I urge Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord, again, in their position in Christ. So you can imagine, Paul wrote this letter to the church. It would have been read out loud, right? And so as they're reading this letter, right, and Paul calls these two women out by name. So that might have been a little uncomfortable, right? But Paul wasn't afraid to confront, and he did it in love. He says, I, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel, right? They're saved. They love Jesus. They've been partners in the gospel. They, he says, at my side, right? These, these women were faithfully serving and sharing the gospel. They were uh, prominent in the church, but now they're having a disagreement along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. And so Paul challenges them to deal with it. And listen, if we're going to have a courageous faith and we're going to deal with these things, sometimes we have to deal with conflict. Right? Sometimes we disagree, but we need to find ways to work through those things, and we do it, again, in the Lord. Right? There's times where we have disagreements and conflict about this and that, but he says, I want you to find unity in your faith and in Christ. Then Paul's going to move on. Again, we could, we could spend a whole message here, but we lack, lack the time. But look at verse 4. Paul's going to move to this critical area of our lives that we all sometimes struggle with. He says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord... Always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. And Paul's going to give a couple commands here in this next section. And he says, he says, I want you to rejoice. And now remember where Paul's writing from. Where's Paul at? Somebody help me out. He's in prison in Rome. Right, so his circumstances are not comfortable or easy or good or fair. Right? Paul hadn't done anything wrong. The only thing Paul had done was faithfully live for and serve Jesus and his call in his life. But God allowed him to be in prison. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, always. He says, let me, let me say it again. Right? He knows that, that sometimes we need to hear things twice. Rejoice, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Paul says, choose joy again. Notice where we get our joy. He says, in what? The Lord. That our joy is a gift from God. It's something we experience because of our relationship with God. Paul's also very clear that we experience it in relationship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. But he says, find your joy. Choose to rejoice in the Lord. Not in your circumstances. Right? We tend to tie our joy to our circumstances. If things are going well, then we're joyful. And if things are not going well, we're not joyful. And listen, circumstances are going to change. There's going to be good days in life, wonderful days, and there's going to be bad days. There's going to be hard days, difficult days, painful days, lonely days. And he says, in all of those days, rejoice, choose joy, not in your circumstances, not in your stuff. Right? Sometimes as Americans, we think, it's about our stuff, right? That if we have this house or we live in this place, then, then I'll be happy or I'll have joy. Or our status, right? If I have a certain status, if I have a certain position. And it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to fall into that thinking. But Paul says, no, rejoice in the Lord always. Not, not just when you feel like it, not just when it's easy, but always. And it's hard. Right? If this were easy, Paul wouldn't have had to say it twice. Right? It's hard because there's all kinds of things in life that, that seem to rob our joy. I, I was just thinking about that because it, it takes courage. It takes courage. It takes a courageous faith to be able to rejoice always. It takes a courageous faith that your faith is not just in what you see, not just what you're experiencing in the moment, but that your faith is in Christ. It's in the Lord. So life, life is often going to interrupt our joy. Right? It could be a text message. How many of you have ever said, I got a text message that interrupted my joy, all right? Most all of us. It could be something you saw on Instagram that interrupted your joy. It could be a doctor's report, report a relationship problem, family problems, school problems, audition results. Right? There, there's all kinds of things in life that seem to interrupt our joy and make joy hard. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Choose joy. And listen, again, Paul lived this out. Not only was he in Rome... In, in prison at the time he's writing, but remember, for those of you here last week, all the way back last Monday, which seems like ages ago now, that when we began this journey, we said that while Paul was in Philippi, 
right? He was persecuted, right? He, he cast a demon out of a young girl who was able to tell the future and, and everybody got mad and they, they had him whipped and beaten and thrown into prison. And in the middle of the night, after being beaten and bloody and, and, and locked up in chains, Paul and Silas were singing hymns of praise to God. They were choosing joy, not in their circumstances, not in their comfort, not in their status, but they were choosing joy in the Lord. And God used it powerfully. And so Paul says, choose joy in the Lord. He says, rejoice. Then he says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. Right? That our joy, our ability to rejoice in the Lord despite our circumstances becomes a witness to the saving power of God, to the supernatural joy of God, so that others can see. And for for Paul and Silas that night, their joy in the Lord became a witness to the other prisoners. It became a witness to the jailer, who's that night, his family, he and his entire family put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior. And so Paul says, let your graciousness be known to others. And not just as they see our joy, but focusing on others. Because one of the things that we deal with with worry and with anxiety is that we get very self-focused. Have you ever noticed that? That all of a sudden you realize, and you didn't intend to be like that, it, it just, you start to realize, man, all of my thinking, all of my focus, it's on me. It's on my problems, my issues. And listen, we need to deal with ourselves. That's not wrong. But we can become over-focused on ourselves. Joy is found in Christ, but it's also found in putting others ahead of ourself, right? The old acronym, Jesus, Others, and You, right? It's kind of corny, but it, it is true, right? That, that there's joy in putting others first. And sometimes even when you're hurting and even when you're dealing with junk, by taking time to focus on others, it's very freeing. I, I know I've found that to be true in my own life, that sometimes I've gotten so absorbed in my own self and problems and worries that sometimes it just helps to focus on someone else, ask them how they're doing and put my my attention on someone else. And we do this, Paul said, because the Lord is near. His presence is with us, right? We're able to do this because we're not alone. We're able to do this because Jesus hasn't left us, forgotten us, nor abandoned us. And so it takes courage. And in those moments, we have to put our faith in who we know of Jesus, in what we know of Jesus. Not in our circumstances. Paul says that we don't focus on what we see, but what is unseen. And so our focus, our focus has to be on Jesus. Paul learned that. And we have to learn that. That what God shows us in the light, you know, one of my prayers is that while you're here, that God has been revealing himself to you and that you're seeing him, maybe in ways you've never seen him. And that's important. Because when you go home, And when difficult days come, and when dark days come, and when struggles come, you need to remember what God showed you. Because what God showed you, and what God taught you, and what He let you see of Him is still true. And there'll be times where God lets us see, and feel, and experience something, and it's sort of like a mountaintop experience, and we just, we don't want to leave, right? I I don't want to leave. I would would like this to be a year-round thing, except we would all collapse in exhaustion, but we don't want to leave. It's so good, but but we have to, right? God calls us. And so sometimes He brings us up on the mountain and He lets us see Him and He lets us see things so clearly. But then, just a short while later, we're back in the valley. And God allows that. He ordains that. And what we learned on the mountain, what we saw so clearly, He wants us to trust in the dark, even when we can't see and even when we don't understand. And we do that because the promises of God. So then Paul goes on in verse 6. He says, don't worry about anything. How many of you say, that makes me worried because now I'm worried that I worry about too much, right? (laughs) But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, don't worry about anything. But we tend to worry about everything, right? How many of you say, just be honest, I worry about everything. All right. Now, look around, right? Is it encouraging to know you're not alone? 
right? That doesn't mean it takes away our struggle, but it is comforting and encouraging to know we're not the only one. Sometimes Satan, who tries to isolate us and make us think, you're the only one who's ever struggled with this. You're the only one who's ever dealt with this. Everyone else is doing so well. You're failing. You're not getting it. You're not a good Christian. Have you ever been there? Have you ever heard those voices? Right? That's not your Father in Heaven. That's Satan. Right? Because you're not alone. And worry is something we all, to some extent, deal with. It's when we imagine the future in a terrible way. Now, I've been, read some statistics and take them for what they're worth, but it's been said that over 90% of the things that we worry about never actually happen, which is pretty extraordinary. And maybe you, even, you, know, you can probably think of some examples sometime. You were so worried about something, right, and you were just sure it was going to be terrible, and then what happened? It wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. Now, I, I want you to know that we're not talking about, when we talk about worry, we're not talking about being concerned for someone. Right? There, are, there, are, there are situations in life where we have genuine love and concern for others. I'm not talking about clinical anxiety or depression or things like that, although what we're talking about will help with that. Uh, last year, 2018, I went through a very, very difficult battle with anxiety. It's something that I have probably dealt with most of my life but wasn't necessarily aware of. But last March, I had a series of panic attacks that led to a season of anxiety that was very difficult. And so I just want you to know, if you're there or you struggle with those things, I understand. You're not alone. It's okay. And so I I don't want you to hear what we're about to talk about, because we're going to talk about prayer, and I don't want you to hear that you can just pray a prayer and your anxiety should go away, right? That doesn't work like that. But the things we're going to talk about will help you, and they've helped me. So I want you to know, and God's been gracious, he's brought me through that. I, my anxiety is over in the corner right now behaving itself, right, is how I would describe it. Uh, but it's still there, and that's okay, because God's with me, and he's with you. And so don't, don't think that you are less of a Christian, or that you don't love Jesus, right, because those things are real, those things happen to us. And Paul knew that his brothers and sisters faced worry, and they faced anxiety. Listen, they, the believers in Philippi, they were facing external threats, Right? There was internal opposition sometimes. How many of you ever had a situation where just going to church made you feel anxious? Right? right? I've been there. Business meetings? Yeah. Anxiety. Right? And so Paul knew that. And so he wanted them to know that Jesus understood, but that Jesus offered them something in their worry and in their anxiety and in their fear. And so Paul says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So Paul says, I understand that you're going to feel worried. I understand you're going to feel anxiety. I understand you're going to feel, feel fear. But here's what I'm inviting you to do. I'm inviting you to pray. I'm inviting you to take your fear and your worry and your anxiety to your Heavenly Father. He says, in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. Feeling worried or anxious is not the sin, right? Feeling worried or anxious is not sin. It's what we do with that, right? It's what I do with my worry. What do I do with my anxiety? What do I do with that? And Paul's going to say prayer is essential. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about some other essentials. But today, I want to focus on prayer. Prayer is essential in our battle with anxiety. But listen, it's not as though you're going to pray and then instantly feel better. On some of my worst days that I was struggling so deeply, I would pray and I'd cry out to God. And I would expect that that maybe, okay, like, and I get done praying and I'm like, oh, I'm still anxious, right? It didn't go away. It didn't work. But God was at work. And God doesn't always work in our timing and our way. Right? And so it's not that you can just pray away your anxiety that or your worry or your fear that it'll just be instantly gone. But it's a practice, it's a habit that God calls us to and He calls us to cast our cares on Him. Peter would tell us, cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. And so God invites us to take our worry and our fear and our anxiety and bring it to Him. Because here's the thing, worrying doesn't accomplish anything. Your wor- the worrying doesn't fix anything and it doesn't solve anything. And listen, I still struggle with worry, okay? So I'm not, don't feel put down if you're worrying, but, but realize the truth. Worrying doesn't accomplish anything, but prayer can accomplish anything. 
Right? Worry accomplishes nothing, but prayer can accomplish anything. It won't instantly make you better, but it's something that God calls us to do. Jesus spoke of the foolishness of worry. Jesus plainly said, don't worry about your life. Right now, there's times where people will tell you not to worry, and you worry more because of the person who told you not to worry, right? You know, have you ever had someone say, hey, don't worry about it, and you're like, actually, I need, if you're telling me not to worry, I need to be worried. I get that. But when Jesus tells you not to worry about your life, you can trust Him. Because He's the Creator of all of the earth. He is the sustainer of all life. He's the Savior of the world. He loves you. And He lit, died for you. And He rose from the dead for you. He's at the right hand of the Father, even right now, praying for you. Rooting for you. He loves you. And He calls you to trust Him. And He says, don't worry about your life. And Paul says, pray with thanksgiving, which seems odd, but when we are thankful, when we choose gratefulness, when we choose gratitude, it changes our, our thinking. Right? So even, even in your worst days, and if you're fighting a battle with fear or worry or anxiety, or maybe it's something else, maybe it's physical, maybe it's something else you're going through, relational, but even on those days, there are things that you can be thankful for. You can be thankful that Jesus loves you. You can be thankful that He died for you. You can be thankful that He's with you. You can be thankful that He's not going to waste what you're going through. Listen, God never wastes your pain. You may not see why. You may not understand why. You may not see how. And it may not ever be apparent. But God will never waste what you go through. He works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. Not everything is good. Some things happen to you that are completely not good. But God is able to take the not good and use it for good in our lives. And I've even been able to see, listen, in the middle of my worst days with anxiety, you could not have convinced me that there was any way God would use this for good. But He's been able to use it to show me things about Himself and His power, but He's also given me a platform to help others and to talk to others who are walking through the same journey. And I never would have been able to do that without God taking me through what He did. And God won't waste your pain. We can trust Him. And listen to the promise that Paul says, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That word peace means harmony or tranquility. He says the peace of God, which is it's supernatural. It's, it's not a natural peace that we seek. He says the supernatural peace of God, which surpasses every thought. It's greater than your thoughts. It's greater than your worry, greater than your anxiety, greater than your fear. He says that peace will guard, military term that Paul uses there. The idea that, that, that peace is on duty to protect our hearts and to protect our minds and our emotions and our thoughts. And so this is the peace of God that's, that's greater than we can understand, that surpasses our, all of our struggles and worries. It says it'll guard your heart and your mind. In, again, in Christ Jesus, your spiritual position in Christ. And, and listen, that doesn't mean that all the fear and worry and pain are going to just go away. It doesn't mean the anxiety will just drop off the, the radar. But what it is is that even in the middle of that valley, even in the valley of depression, even in the struggle with anxiety or whatever it else is that you're facing, God says, I can give you peace. Right? It might not go away and you still may struggle. And sometimes we wrestle with that because we know God could snap His fingers and take it away. Right? But He doesn't always choose to do that. Jesus said there will be trials and tribulations. Sometimes God allows us to walk through difficult things. He allowed Paul to be in prison, but it wasn't because He didn't love Paul. He had a purpose for Paul in prison. There was ways that he would have never been able to serve God if he wasn't there. And God doesn't make mistakes. And so I I want you to realize that that we can trust God and that His peace is something that we can experience even in the midst of the battle. Even in the midst of the turmoil. Tomorrow we're going to continue the the conversation and and, and thoughts about worry and anxiety as Paul continues that in Philippians chapter 4. And We're going to talk about how we participate in this process. But I just this morning I want you to think about Paul's challenge in verse 1, where he says this again, So then, in, in this way, my dear loved, dearly loved brothers, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord. Listen, all kinds of things are going to come at us and we're going to have to deal with, but you have strength and power available to you. 
And I want you to be able to have a courageous faith in Christ and to be able to stand firm and to choose joy. Even in the midst of the pain and the struggle. And listen, we are called to take these pain, this pain and this struggle and this worry and fear and anxiety and to bring it to Jesus. Listen, the Psalms teach us that God's okay with us pouring out our hearts to Him. You can tell Him how you feel. He already knows how you feel. Right? You can tell Him, God, I don't like this. I wish it wasn't like this. I'm struggling with this. I don't understand. I'm confused. I'm hurting. I don't like this. You can tell your Father in Heaven that He will not be put off or offended. But I would also invite you as you pour out your heart to Him to also proclaim, as the psalmist did over and over again, your trust and your confidence in Him, even when you don't see or understand. And I would also encourage you to praise Him and to worship Him, even in the middle of your pain, struggle, doubts, whatever it might be, to worship Him, to acknowledge Him, to, to praise Him for who He is, because who He is has not changed. Right? God never, ever changes. And so we worship and we pray. And again, I already mentioned Peter, but I think about Peter who wrote to the church, he says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. And listen, Peter knew that. Peter was with Jesus when he watched Jesus heal the blind and cause the lame to walk. Jesus was there when a woman caught in adultery was dragged before Jesus as Jesus was teaching in the temple. And angry men who had just as much sin as she did wanted to stone her for her sin of adultery. And Jesus, Peter was a witness as Jesus wrote in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. And as the men dropped their rocks and walked away, and as Jesus looked at her with eyes of grace and love and compassion and said, where are your accusers? And then he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He saw the compassion of Jesus. He was there when Mary and Martha were broken over the death of their brother Lazarus and they were grieving. And Peter watched as Jesus cried with them. And Peter knew personally how Jesus had forgiven him and restored him after his failure that we talked about last, yesterday. And so Peter could personally say, you can cast your cares on him. He really, really does care for you. He loves you. And Paul says there's a promise. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. Worry does not empty today of its sorrow. It only empties today of its strength. Corey Ten Boom wrote that having experienced some of the worst of humanity and evil full force. But she learned that God could be trusted anywhere and everywhere. I want to close real quickly with a, a story of a, a very well-known hymn, but it was written by, a, name, by name, a woman named Louisa Stead. And she uh, was one day at the beach with her husband and her son. And uh, another young man there began to struggle in the water. And her husband went in to try to save him, but unfortunately they both drowned. This was many, many, many years ago when it was very, very hard for women to find work or support themselves. And she struggled to have, find ways to meet the needs of herself and her son. But God provided for them. And it, she told a story one time of how God had, uh, when they didn't have enough to eat, she prayed and, and they came home and there was food that was waiting for them on their porch. And about two years after her husband's death, she wrote the words of, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." And she said, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord." She said, there's times where you don't see, but His promises are enough and you can trust Him. And, and, and then in the last verse, she said, I'm so glad I've learned to trust Him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that He is with me and will be with me to the end. Listen, here's what I want you to know. More than anything, what I want you to know this morning is that your Savior is always with you. And He has never forgotten you. He has never abandoned you. He's not far from you even when He feels far. And if you're in the battle with worry and anxiety and all those things, I want you to call out to your Savior and to trust Him. But I also want you to find the support of others. You're in a safe place. You can talk to me, your counselors, your faculty. They love you. Many of us know that struggle. You're not alone. But more than anything, I want you to know that your Savior is with you. And I want you to pray and to call, cast your cares on Him because He cares 
for you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. Even when you allow things in our life that we don't understand, like, or struggle to, to figure out. But Father, I thank you that none of the things that affect us, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual, none of those things are an absence of your love for us. None of those things mean that you don't care for us or that you're disappointed in us or that we're, we're, we're somehow failed. But Father, I pray that we would understand that even in those places, you are faithful and good and that you love us. And I pray that everyone here this morning, student, counselors, faculty, staff, I pray that, and myself, I pray that all of us would know that you love us and that we can cast our cares on you and that you've promised. And Father, help us to claim that. Pro- you've promised that you would give us your peace. And so, Father, for the ones that need peace today, Father, I pray that they would claim that promise. And knowing that you are a faithful God, I pray that you'd wash your peace around their heart and their mind today. In Jesus' name, amen.